Africa is once again set to host the Conference of Parties of the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change. World leaders will converge on Egypt for the 27th edition of the event. Now, according to a 2021 report by the United Nations, climate change constitutes an existential threat to the lives and livelihoods of about 490 million people living in extreme poverty across Africa. As Africa's big brother, Nigeria bears a chunk of the continent's climate impacts. This year alone, more than 200 lives have been lost to fatal floods due to rising sea levels, washing away shorelines. Desertification and deforestation in the north has uh, exacerbated clashes between farmers and herders who are moving deeper into the south in search of pasture for their flocks. Uh, the impact on the availability of, of, flo of food rather, has been devastating. As Nigeria prepares for the COP27, these and more uh, the issues he will present before other leaders as the world struggles to address the impact of climate change. Joining us now is the Executive Director, Corporate Accountability and Public Participation Africa, Akimbodi Olufemi. Akimbodi, it's good to have you join me this morning. Good morning. Good morning. Thanks for joining us. Now, uh, COP27 is, is already here. One would say it's still far away, but others would say, well, what it takes to prepare for COP27, if we don't start now, we can't get it. But let's come to the issues. How ready is Nigeria as at this time for COP27 in Egypt? Uh, well, that, that's the biggest That is the biggest question uh, in our mind in terms of how do we get the Nigerian government that is going to represent us, uh, frontline communities, as well as CSOs, to look at critically what should be the Nigerian uh, agenda at COP27, which is barely a month away. Uh, for us as a society, we have tried uh, yesterday and today to bring together government officials, to bring together frontline communities, academics, and um, CSOs like us across the nation to, to sit down and have a cold conversation about COP27, climate change, and, and, and we say, and beyond. Why are we saying this is because climate change itself uh, is an essential problem. It's a global crisis. Uh, the, the last intergovernmental panel report on climate change uh, is, is extremely damning and extremely uh, uh, alerting all of us about the dangers of inaction that if current trends continue, um, Africa will be at a very, very terrible situation. Um, uh, about 700 million people could be displaced on the continent. Um, about uh, 250 million people could be at the risk of water stress. Uh, and you know, agriculture is going to be affected. Local livelihoods are going to be destroyed. And every year, we do go to COP as African countries, including Nigeria. And then the point is this, what does climate change, what does the COP mean to us as Nigeria? What are we taking to COP? What are we bringing back from COP? What, how, how are we as a government uh, faring in our response to climate change? And these are the discussions that we've been holding since yesterday. And I can tell you, we're really not sure that Nigeria as a country is preparing for COP. All right. Now, you would recall that sometime in 2019, about 100 billion US dollars was promised developed countries. And now uh, that promise is said to not have been fulfilled. And now COP is coming to Africa and Egypt. How significant is it for Africa to host this despite uh, the unfulfilled promise that's on the one hand? And on the second hand, what should Nigeria be putting forward at COP? Well, the issue of climate financing is very critical. And we, 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 we as a society are trying to tell African government 
to go to court to be able to extract concrete commitment for the historical ecological damages that the North had inflicted on the Global South, particularly Africa. Now, Africa contributed less than 3% of the, to the problems of global warming, but we are the receiving end of, of global warming. So it's imperative that our governments made that very, very clear agenda in terms of how to get the funds to, to, to finance climate change. Africa, for instance, did about $250 billion to, to tackle the problems already created mostly by corporations, by the North overconsumption in, in, in the North. And these commitments have to be uh, somehow, I don't want to say enforceable for lack of, of, of better word. These are issues we're trying to say that what actually makes the Egypt COP an African COP is not just by hosting the COP on an African uh, soil, on an African nation, but the ability for Africa to have its own agenda in terms of loss and damage, in terms of polluters' pay principle, in terms of commitment even by African government themselves, that when we come back home, this and this are what we're going to do. We've raised uh, some alarm about the Nigerian Climate Change Act. Thank goodness the Council for Climate Change has been constituted. But the only good thing there is that the President Buhari himself recognized that that act has some problems and that review should commence immediately. We really need concrete action, even within our country, in terms of gas flaring. Uh, I mean, uh, in your introduction, you mentioned the issue of flood. What are we doing in terms of flood? How are we transiting? How is Nigeria moving pro to a post-fossil economy? Look, climate change is a, a bigger problem that you know, nations around the world are responding to. What is the future of fossil? What is even the future of our economy as a country? These are conversations that we think we should take very seriously at this point. And, and looking at um, the mandate for a common agenda between uh, state actors and non-state actors using you know, Nigeria now as a you know, benchmark or you know, just for the sake of this argument or conversation, uh, and if you will look at how far we've gone as a country year in, year out that we prepare for uh, a yearly event as this, uh, what are your expectations? So uh, for, for a very long time, the CSOs seems to uh, have some very clear agenda on climate change. And recently, we've also seen some pronouncements, as it were, from, let's say, from the presidency. Uh, we've heard them talking about Nigeria is going to be net zero by the year 2060. And uh, we've raised alarm about, well, the net zero is not zero. Uh, we should work towards a real zero um, approach to, to climate change. And the academics, there will also be academic papers. Of course, there are things that are verifiable in terms of climate change impact. Elegushi in Lagos, Ayetoro in all those states, as we've mentioned, the northern parts of Nigeria, desert encroachment. And so, for the first time, we try to sit down in, in, in one room and say, this is exactly what we're saying. And we're thinking that uh, by that, that, that conversation that we, we, we ignited, uh, the government could begin to look at critical issues that the civil society has been throwing forward uh, to mitigate climate change in Nigeria. You cannot, for instance, continue to say, look, you, you want to tackle climate change, and, and gas flaring continues at the Niger, in the Niger Delta area of Nigeria. There should be commitment from this government concrete action towards a post-fossil fuel economy, uh, towards you know, bringing down the gas flares uh, uh, for, for, for you know, climate change actions to be impactful in Nigeria. All right. Uh, from the Kyoto Protocol to Copenhagen and so many other COPs that have been held, international conferences on climate change, uh, how would you assess the commitment of nations regarding the agreements and the knowledge of what uh, climate change is and the commitment to ensure that uh, greenhouse gas emissions and all of those issues that threaten uh, uh, the environment are taken care of. What is your assessment of all of the commitments across the nation, especially in Nigeria? I mean, 
I mean, to be frank, COP itself is almost becoming like a big jamboree. With the exception that it affords us the opportunity as people, as civil society, to go there to raise the issues. You know, when you look critically at some of these agreements, you've seen the infiltration of big fossil fuel, big multinationals. Uh, they are trying to steer the agenda at outcomes of this conference towards what is convenient. You know, uh, we begin to see things like net zero and the rest of them. Uh, we begin to see uh, the marketization of carbon. You know, it's about demand and supply. Oh, if I pollute here, I can remediate there, which, which doesn't work. Um, what we need to do, and it's very key, is to look at mechanism to keep the corporations out of the core process and essentially to ensure that the principles and the laws of liability, polluters pay, uh, if Shell, if Chevron, is fossil fuel across the world are polluting the environment, they must be made to pay for their current and historical damage on the climate. Those key principles, and most importantly, cutting emission at cost. Not, you know, all those evasive, uh, you know, principles that the corporations are trying to introduce into the UNFCCC. You, I want to take you up on something you said. You said COP is becoming like a jamboree. Are you saying that you're not confident that this time around uh, the hands of uh, world leaders and even leaders of third world countries will be forced to do better at uh, this uh, edition? You know, when you look at the core agreements, you find out that a lot of them are not binding you know, non-determined contribution, uh, voluntary contribution. We are looking for concrete action that will mandate nations to cut emission from source. Look, take Nigeria, for example. In 2020, 2012, we had what we call the Great Flood, and there were floodings from, you know, almost everywhere. We felt, oh, this was, wasn't going to happen again. And here we are in Nigeria. 2012, we recorded 300 deaths. As of today, the waters are in Lokoja. We are already recording 400 deaths. And the waters are going to move straight to Edo. They are going to move to the Niger Delta areas. If nothing is done, more lives will be lost. More agricultural lands will be lost. This is the reality of climate change today. And we can no longer continue to pay lease service. We need real solution that will cut emission down immediately. Not think they're waiting for, is it 2060 uh, uh, or 2070 in India, Nigeria 2060. How many of us are going to be alive till that time? I mean, technology and the rest of them will have even moved. Uh, uh, I mean, those, those are what I'm talking about, that look, we real climate action now. We've been uh, talking about the expectations uh, ahead of the COP27, which is uh, scheduled to be hosted in Egypt. Uh, that will be later in October. And uh, a key st stakeholder, Akimbode Olufemi, the executive director of CAPA, has been with us over the past couple of minutes to shed more light on the issue. And Mr. Akimbode, coming on the heels of um, your event uh, at the stakeholders' workshop, which um, CAPA organized, let me ask briefly though on you were talking about how we can get more commitments from corporations from um, you know nations w where is the place of imposing sanctions in in this um, ideal and um, when you talk about a common agenda for africa how easy will it be seen as africa has been called the biggest uh, burden bearer of the climate crisis Well, in terms of uh, getting an African agenda, first thing is that um, charity begins at home. 
What we've tried to do is to do a convening that will call climate change COP27 and beyond. And we brought together government officials, the Ministry of Environment was well represented. Uh, we brought in academics, researchers on climate change, and uh, we brought in campaigners, renowned campaigners on climate change, both nationally and uh, within the region. And what we try to do is to look at the climate change uh, well, meeting, convening COP27, from first, the Nigerian lens. What are we as Nigerians going to be asking for at COP? Uh, what are frontline communities saying? Um, and from that conference, we begin to see areas of commonalities and areas of differences that we possibly could be, we could work on today or we work on post COP. The seed we're trying to sow is that, you know, why the governments have been elected to represent us, to, to, to negotiate on our behalf at the, at the convention. They should also listen to what civil society is saying. They should also listen to the cries of frontline communities. If there must be a climate action, it must also include remediation. It must include, as I've said earlier, the liability that uh, corporations have to bear for their historical, current, and future damage on the environment. This must also include what we call just transition. We must trans translate to new uh, um, uh, 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 development that will recognize local communities, that will recognize that we have to protect frontline communities. Those are the issues that we are bringing uh, forward. And as I said earlier, most importantly, we must be able to hold COP without undue interference of the big fossil fuel, big polluters that cause the problem in the first instance. I also asked about you know, the, uh, whether it could be a game changer if you impose sanctions as is done elsewhere to get more commitments yes. from nations. Yes, I mentioned the liability. Uh, we have a document that we call liability roadmap, and which spe uh, specifically spelled out how governments, how nations can inflict you no know, taxes, levies of, of corporations that destroy the environment. We launched this document at the last COP. We will continue to push the document, we we'll continue to push the liability agenda because, I mean, this is a just basic human environment concept that if you are in the village and you pollute our common water, you are made to pay uh, for the damages. I mean, it will be the basic concept of loss and damage. So, government should begin to see how they impose reasonable fines on corporations and their practices that are, that are damaging the environment. And then with that, we will be able to get the kind of financing we're talking about. We're talking about multi-billion dollars corporations that have extracted crude oil from the Niger Delta, leaving behind debt and destruction. All right, uh, Akimbo, a lot of uh, NGOs are committed to, to the climate change agenda, and they are uh, reminding, in fact, they, their presence remind government and the activity remind government of the need and the urgency to uh, do something about. But in all of this, what kind of engagement are NGOs like yours and others doing? How are they engaging government to the realities of all of these issues and to the urgency of the need to take action now? Well, first, as I said, we brought them, we brought them into the room in Abuja. They listen to us, we listen to them. We, uh, as CAPA, are currently producing a policy document that covers climate change response in Nigeria, Uganda, and South Africa. We are also specifically going to produce a document, a policy document that will be Nigerian centered, Nigerian focused from this conference we are currently holding in Abuja. 
which is essentially to be able to engage government. We'll continue our engagement, you know, post the conference, post COP27, to sit down together to look at how uh, our government can give us the kind of environmental friendly representation that we need. All right. Um, earlier, you spoke about uh, climate financing, and I want us to look at the structure for a bit. Uh, it is said that uh, the climate finance structure is quite biased, where uh, some continents that suffer the most uh, receive little financing. And I'm wondering if we still have to keep uh, waiting on developed countries for financing, why are we not galvanizing efforts across continents, like Africa, for instance, to get financing on our own? So this is a very interesting topic on, on the issue of climate change. But I, I tell you, the corporations are very careful and they are very slick. Uh, what they have tried to do is to monetize uh, the destruction that they have done. Okay. We are going to have um, uh, the climate change uh, mechanism. We are going to have uh, uh, all sorts of initiatives that they know are actually based on the market principles. So you quantify what I pollute, and then you pay a, a, a fragment of funds. Um, even our vice president went to the United States on this use of climate change to, to propose what he called um, climate for debt. Uh, Action. I, I think what we need to do and look at critically beyond all this is that somebody caused a problem. The corporations that cause all this problem should first be made to account for those damages. Of course, nations also need to put in you know, commitments. Commitments not only in funds, but even reducing emission. You cannot say you're looking for money to solve a problem while you continue to escalate the problem yourself. Um, we're studying proposals like, I mean, what the Vice President Jamie Oshibajo made, and whether this is also another diversion from the I mean, accountability issue. But most importantly, as I stress, is that a lot of financing who come from liability, a lot of financing could come from the global notes paying for, you know, destroying Africans' climate, African environment, causing the climate crisis for their development. And from that, they should be able to produce enough financing for Africa to, to be able to build a resilient climate um, response. And, and talking about the vice president's proposal, that's the, uh, the climate swap deal uh, being uh, proposed uh, by him. I, I know he was scheduled to speak at uh, your event. Uh, what uh, feelers uh, can you share in that regard? And, and what do you think about this option? Well, we were expecting him to come and throw light on that proposal. Uh, we know he has a very busy schedule. We had uh, some kind of representation from his office yesterday. Uh, we hope today they might be able to make some complete representation. Um, as I said earlier, we have not responded because it is a lot of mathematics involved even in climate financing. And we're trying to understudy what exactly it meant. One thing I want to tell you is there is an energy crisis globally. There is a war in Ukraine. Uh, and every time you know, the global north is in a crisis, they rushed to Africa. You know, our VP went to the uh, US, and then less than two weeks, John Kerry was here. You know, Nigeria signed the, um, what it's, uh, the Niger Delta Morocco gas pipeline. So we, we, we really still don't know what happened to the West African gas pipeline that is supposed to go to Algeria. And then we were told that the energy will, you know, the pipeline will go as far as Spain. So you could see again that Africa is becoming another new you know, uh, space for the scramble for oil. When in their own countries, they're actually reducing consumption of fossil. Um, we need to situate all this in the context. You understand? 
so mm -hmm. that we can see what exactly can be a Nigerian agenda from what is going on in the energy space, energy crisis that is happening in the globe. Look, immediately the war in Ukraine is over, a lot of this country have said they are transiting from fossil fuel. Nigeria should wake up and think about a post fossil economy. Mm -hmm. This is not going to last. The end of oil has come. We've been talking about climate change and the COP27 that we're holding in Egypt uh, sometime in November. And uh, we're looking at what is the agenda for Nigeria. Uh, we've been speaking to Akimbo Olufemi. He is the executive director of the Corporate Accountability and Public Participation Africa. And he has been, uh, you know, making sense of all of these and how we used to, how we're supposed to uh, pay attention to some of the challenges that we have in our environment. Now, uh, Akimbo, the, the, the issue of, uh, in, in the last COP26 in Glasgow, Scotland, President Muhammadu Buhari made a commitment, the Nigerian commitment, and unveiled the uh, 2060 agenda for zero uh, emission target for Nigeria. Now, from your standpoint, how optimistic are you that by 2060, Nigeria will meet uh, this obligation and commitment? Well, before you have any optimism, you have to have a clear roadmap and uh, a clear work plan. First is that the zero itself is not real zero. Uh, I don't even know, I don't even understand what, Niger what the Nigerian government means by achieving net zero by 2060. And unfortunately, maybe there could be something that will make us understand what they are saying. Uh, we've not seen even any concrete document uh, uh, about how Nigeria wants to cut down from 2022 to 2060 that will make them achieve what they call Zero. Yes, they've ticked a few of the boxes. There's the National Climate Act, and as I said earlier, that act itself uh, contains a lot of problems. There was also the Pet Petroleum Industry Act, uh, which in itself is a missed opportunity for Nigeria to redeem a lot of the problems that we've seen associated with the oil and gas sector in Nigeria uh, because of its fundamental flaws. Now. The president, while integrating the Climate Council, acknowledged the fact that the Climate Act itself has a lot of problems and makes it difficult for them to implement. So we are still at the basics of the Nigerian government, even setting a basic you know, document, a basic framework to address climate change in Nigeria. And so uh, it's just easy for me to say we've not seen much. I told you earlier, we're, we're doing um, some sorts of data collection towards uh, producing uh, a book about how far with the commitments that was made in Glasgow, and that's not limited to Nigeria. We're doing this in Nigeria, Uganda, and, and South Africa. And, and to be able to clearly, like a scorecard, to show these countries that, yes, you made these commitments, and this is how far you have gone. And I can tell you from the data we've seen so far, uh, they have not been encouraging at all. You mentioned something about uh, the government not uh, setting up basic framework. And I'm wondering if this is because we do not know how much our inaction is costing us. See, I, I, I think Nigeria needs to demonstrate more political will. Nigeria needs to, and when I say Nigeria, I mean the Nigerian government. Nigerian government needs to ensure that it's broad-based, uh, it has an inclusive uh, consultation, uh, particularly as regards you know, the CSOs and I said frontline communities in the climate change response agenda. Um, I, I also think that maybe there was a disconnect between the technical team of the climate change department and the final products that came up as the, as the, as the climate act. Um, those are issues that this current government
needs to take critically. And I, and I tell you this, we cannot run away from it. Nigeria as a nation itself must be able to make sacrifices to protect the climate. We cannot just sit down and expect that, oh, the, the global West is going to continue to finance a climate change response. We have to look critically at the five sectors that they are looking at about how and what can the Nigerian government do. And I, and I stressed and overstressed it. You cannot be talking about climate change when your, the, the, the petroleum industry act again allows corporations to continue to fly gas and that they can fly gas forever. But what's even the, the worst case scenario now? Uh, because it's, it's clearly seen that this is a matter of interest versus interest. Uh, selfish interest, you know, playing up, you know, louder and louder. Where, where are we headed if adequate action isn't taken? Well, I, I, I said it earlier. About 250 million Africans will be under uh, water stress. Lots of the Look, climate change is no longer just an environmental problem. Climate change is an economic problem. Climate change is a social problem. Climate change is a public health problem. We're beginning to see diseases that we rarely or we don't even see at all now affecting humans. The human race, as it were, is under threat from activities that we have conducted. Today, Lokoja is battling. Kogi State is battling with flood. That water, it's going to go down and down and affect several communities. Their local livelihoods will go. The entire northern part of Nigeria is facing the certification. Uh, Lake Chad is shrinking. Now, you look at the response of communities to Lake Chad, and you can also link that even with the current security crisis that we have in Nigeria. This is how intertwined you know, uh, issues of climate change are. Until now, a lot of grazing happened in the Gongola Basin, what is called the Gongola Basin. That also is shrinking. They do not have places to graze animals. And what do we, do we see? We'll see headers migrating down south into Nigeria. We need to begin to take action now so that this internal migration that is stressing communities, that is causing headers, farmer class clashes, all around Nigeria, Nigeria can also be tackled. All right, uh, talking about the issue of action, uh, I, I wonder what other action that we, or what are those practical actions that we need to take? Recall that uh, in the last administration, there was the, the, the great green wall uh, in the northern part of the country uh, against desertification. And uh, they also talked about the issue of uh, stopping deforestation and all of that. But talk to us basically in, in itemizing them, what action needs to be taken for people to really understand that it's not even just government in Abuja <clears throat> or in the state capitals only, but individuals also have to be in the driver's seat of taking this action. You see, my brother, I always refrain from, you know, when government victimize the people, uh, when government share away from their responsibility. Uh, see, we elected people into leadership because we want them to lead. We want them to champion our common cause. We want them to take the leadership. They want, we want them, we just don't want to live like uh, a colony of animals. Even some colonies of animals, you have governance structure. So it is a responsibility of the government to show leadership and then the citizens themselves. Yes, there are you know, actions we can take individually by you know, cutting down our carbon footprints, uh, as, it, as it's called. Um, but in doing that, why is government not looking also as environment-friendly you know, transport system? Why are they not putting in place you know, less carbon, you know, burning, carbon producing, uh, 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 public transport system. Those are the issues that we begin to look. We can also begin to look at our consumption pattern. Uh, unfortunately, again, the government is not giving Nigerian choices. Why, you know, the West, you know, governments around the West are developing technologies uh, that promotes um, 
uh, electric cars, all manners of renewables. Uh, why Nigerians are ready to even, because of the failure of the power system, some Nigerians are you know, struggling to opt for solar energy, you'll be shocked and amazed at how, about how expensive some of these are. And these are things I'm talking about that look for you as a government to want citizens to take action. What are the measures in terms of your fiscal policy that you are using to encourage citizens to, to, to take climate-friendly actions? All right, we'll wait to see how these things all will pan out. Uh, thank you so much, Akimbo Olufemi, for joining us on this uh, discussion this time. Thank you.